This is a wonderful treat to be back here and look at this place and the changes. It's so nice and bright. My wife just asked me if, if it was always this nice and bright. I said no, it was, it was a dark beige, <laughs> kind of a dingy color. And talk about changes. You know, I think I worked at all the stations over my career, but everybody had their favorites. And Old 11 definitely was one. It was a wonderful station. Always had a, a really good crew. And uh, it, w it was just a pleasure. And the changes, if I can explain them downstairs maybe here. This was all apparatus floor. The pumper was parked facing the apparatus doors out there. It was parked over here. The aerial ladder was parked on this side. <laughs> of course, you've all seen the hose tower outside. That's where the hose was hung. Back here was our coat racks, where our, all our bunker gear was, and our helmets. Coke machines sat right here. <laughs> Very important part of the station. And the washroom was up at the front doors up there. Now the washroom was the nerve center of the station. That's where each firefighter had to spend two hours of his shift at that desk with the phone right there. The calls came in over the speaker normally. Sometimes we would get a call over the desk phone. But they came in over the speaker. It was a long tone. We called it the beep. It was like a doot. And then they say, come in number 11. Take your unit to the corner of Dundas and Stormont, we'll say. <laughs> or take the pump only or take the aerial only. The pumper went on all medical calls. Now, we had very few medical calls when I first came on, but that increased, and the boys were telling me today that almost 40% of their calls are medical. Everything from overdoses to heart attacks to, and uh, that's it. Firefighters do so many different jobs now. Extrication, vehicle accidents, the medical calls, of course, and fire calls. But this was quite a busy station. Every station backs up another station and is being backed up by another station. So, number 11 here backed up number two from a person on Eccles or originally at Alberton Line where the old, old OC Transpo was. They also backed up the West End stations, uh, number one on, on Carling and Kirkwood. Uh, formerly, that number one was on Churchill. But things have really changed. But some wonderful time, times here, and this is such a treat today to be here and just recollect, I could just sit here and think of so many different stories. One story I must share with you, a funny story. The Berrigan family lived next door here. Charlie Berrigan owned that garage. He lived in that house. He was a mechanic. We all took our vehicles to him. One day the boys were painting the hose tower, the very top, and they dressed up a dummy <laughs> in a bunker suit with a helmet and the boots and the guy up up on the top of the ladder threw the dummy and screamed. <laughs> well, Mrs. Mrs. Berrigan was looking out her kitchen window. Evidently she fainted. I didn't find out this till after. But <laughs> we were in a little hot water over that prank. <laughs> but the things that were on what went on were unbelievable. <laughs> Most of them I could tell, but some we can't tell, unfortunately. <laughs> we had a rookie by the name of Bill Lowry came to the station, and he was here for a while, and he didn't like the late watch. The person on, in the watch room down there, each, each person had to take a turn on late watch. That was from 10 p.m. till 7 a.m. in the morning. 
and you were all alone there. And uh, as I say, you were near the, you were near the phone. And he, Bill Lowry was really nervous about this. His first night on Late Watch, oh, he was just petrified. Anyways, Lorne Lytle, another fellow firefighter, fire, and, and I approached him and told him, now don't fool around if this guy comes in tonight. Apparently he's got a knife and he carries a gun. But he doesn't bother you, he just likes to talk a little bit. I said, but don't hesitate, ring the fire bell if he comes in. Well, Lorne Lytle and I climbed the host tower down and went out into the laneway. And it was a hot summer night and the windows to the watch room were open. And we ran our fingers down the Venetian blind. <laughs> well, Bill panicked, he rang the fire bell. Of course, the district chief comes down. I thought, oh, are we in hot water now? <laughs> he said, where are we going? He thought we were going on a fire call. Well, he said, that guy came in, but he left. What guy? He said, well, cut Bill. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm looking for a place to hide. <laughs> Anyways, these were the type of pranks that went on. <laughs> over and over again. They certainly shortened up the day. But, uh, so, Ron, you were hired in 1960. 1960, yeah. January the 4th. What kind of trucks did they have back then? I mean, all I've seen is pictures of uh, where the back was open. You didn't have horses back then. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the horses, I think, uh, were here around maybe 1928 uh, until into the 30s. There used to be a picture of the three horses that were here. I can only remember one name was Blackie. Yeah, Bob was here. Famous Bob. Bob? Yeah. That was another one, yes, I've forgotten that. But uh, Dave was talking earlier about happy times and sad times. We had a lot of happy times, but we had a lot of sad times too. More good times than bad times, I must say. I think one of the very worst. We had lots of bad fires, lots lost of people. The kids were the thing that you remembered and had the nightmares about. But we lost a mother and five children on Arthur Lane, backing up number two. Number two. And uh, the happy times, of course, were generally just helping somebody. And every time the bell rang, you were indeed helping somebody. You know, and the happy times were what we called at the time a good stop. In other words, a full-blown kitchen fire and you managed to get in and knock it down. The people were happy and grateful. We were certainly happy. But th those were the happy times. And the school children coming in, you know, the, the classes, they broke up the boredom. It was wonderful. We, we would pick them up and put them in the cab, put the siren on and all the flashing lights, and put a helmet on them. And uh, they got a great kick out of that. And, and, and we did too. And I often wondered how many of those children are, might be on the department today. <laughs> Very interesting. But uh, yeah, I, I explained the, the, the downstairs now. Uh, I explained the watch room, which was the nerve center of the station, the hose tower. This was all apparatus floor. Now, the upstairs, did you want me to explain the upstairs from down here, Dave? We're going to get you to go upstairs later, but absolutely. But I have a young gentleman here that has a question for you. Okay. What's, what's your name? Come on, up, come on up and ask him the question if you'd like. Tell him your name and introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Dean. A little closer. Than Hi, Dean. A little louder. How are you? <laughs> Boy. So, do you ever ride on the back of a fire truck? Did I ever ride on the back? Yeah. I sure did. You know, we all rode on the back in those days. Now they sit quite comfortably up in the cab. And uh, we rode on the back and the side of the aerial as well. Now, this is pretty close, right? There's the, there's the platform on the back. We on that now, but now they go up inside the cab, okay? 
and they put their breathing apparatus on. When we left the station and the call came in, everybody had an SCBA, uh, a self-contained self breathing apparatus. It just contains air, 40.3 cubic feet of air, weighs 29 pounds, and that 29 pounds <laughs> accompanied by your bunker suit, your boots, hose key belt and ladder strap. I forget the overall weight, but it was over 50 pounds. You carried that all the time. You fought the fire in that, with that weight. And, uh, oh, here's the old uh, hose key belt and ladder strap. Now this key was a very, very important part of the firefighters' uh, outfit. This square hole on the top was on the hydrant, fire hydrant. If you look at the top of a fire hydrant, you'll see a square peg. And that turned on the fire hydrant. Every firefighter wore one of these all the time. So there's a young lady right beside you. Maybe you can have her put it on that pretend fire hydrant that we have. Maybe oh, here we are. Cell. There's a key right there. But now, unfortunately, that's a hectagon top. So it's not going to fit. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to fit. Can you hold it and maybe pretend you're putting it on top? Yeah, let's hold it. You hold that like that and put that on there. Now, firefighters, on the way into the fire, they, they call that straight lay. They caught the hydrant. Okay, just like you were opening, and they, the hose came off the back of the fire truck, and, a, and the truck proceeded to the fire. That was called a straight lay. Reverse lay was if you didn't see a fire hydrant on the way in, sometimes you didn't spot them, you got to the fire front, and you had to reverse lay. So the nozzle and the hose stayed at the fire, two or three nozzles and hoses. The pumper backed up and backed himself up to the hydrant. The hydrant supplies the pumper with water. The pumper only supplies the pressure for the hose lines. But the hydrant is very important. That and firefighters have, stations have to back up each other. This was a rule number one. If the pumper was at the fire on the fire ground at the fire front. The immediate responsibility of the incoming pump was to back up that pumper that's on scene. And it's very important. He only has two or three hundred gallons of water, and that goes like that. You know, uh, it, it, apply, it applies the initial water to the fire. So this young lady who is opening up the, this young firefighter lady who's opening up the hydrant. Wow, you she would turn it right. He turn it like that, counterclockwise. The big now there's the, right there would come off. This is a big lug. This is what they call a big lug. Yeah, if you see the pumpers, they have large black pipes on the outside. They're called hard suctions. They go up to the big lug here. That's just called a three-way hydrant. Now, the main size is underneath the hydrant. In other words, the pipes that supply the water are all different sizes. A standard 16-inch main would be, a, 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 I believe, the standard side, but in downtown areas, the big mains go up to 30 inches. So they can supply a lot of water. But this is a three-way hydrant. Now, there's a lot of two-way hydrants, just with these two, two-and-a-half outlets, they're called. They take the large two-and-a-half-inch hose. I guess it would be very important to stand somewhere maybe behind the hydrant when you open it up. <laughs> because those caps would sometimes be loosened by yes, people we'll, that that's want right. to be a little malicious. Exactly. And it would be really dangerous when those caps came off with the pressure. That's for sure. A tremendous, tremendous pressure. I want to thank this young lady. Give her a hand for helping out. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that, dear. <laughs> And I have a, another young chap, well, the same young chap, but he's got another question for you, Ron. Okay. The, why are there so many different types of helmets? On and specifically, he wants to know about your two helmets. Okay, the, these are my two helmets. This I was issued in 1960 as a private. Then I had a lieutenant's helmet 
which was the two horns. And then the captains, I was promoted to captain in the 80s. And this is a captain's helmet. District chiefs are white helmets. So a chief's helmet, I should have brought that chief's helmet and I have one at home too. So you retired in what rank there? I retired, I retired actually acting district chief. I had 259 days, I believe, acting on the car. In other words, I had four to five stations under my command, depending on what section of the city I was in. But my favorite rank was the captaincy. Would um, this young chap be able to put her helmet on? Maybe, Certainly. Maybe, maybe put the black one on because he hasn't earned the rank yet, but you have. And then you can put the other helmet on, and you guys can stand beside each other. There's there we because, go. Uh, oh, yeah. that looks nifty. So get in a little closer. What's your name again? Dean. Dean? Dean. 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 Oh, Dean. Okay, like Dean Martin. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> You're better looking than me. Anybody got that question? Yeah. Raise your hand or yell it out. Why is the helmet metal? A little louder? Why is the helmet metal? Why is the helmet metal? Well, they're not now. These are old fashioned, just like me. <laughs> they're old. These old tin helmets. They, I guess they did their job, but now they're more like the motorcycle and the hockey helmets and the, they're made of that polycarbon material. They're much safer and they're much better. And these were, these were cold as well in <laughs> the winter time. They had a lining. There you go. The, 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 the hand as well. Good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you so much. Thank you, Dean. Um, but, uh, so one of the stories that uh, I was told about Station 11 was um, a tragic situation that took place in 1930. And it was uh, uh, a firefighter, William Pratt, and who left the station to go to a call down yes. Hill Avenue. The old ice house. Yeah, and he never came back. He was crushed by a wall when the ladder fell off the wall and so did the ice house. Um, do you recall, Ron, um, any situations like that? that mm, yes. That back some you know, memories of hardships when a firefighter may have been injured or possibly even killed. I was at the fire on Bank Street. The old Winston Gardens, uh, a dance hall, was above a grocery store, and I'm trying to think, I think it was a law blah, or IG, I just can't remember. But I was called in at, at that fire, called in off duty, because the fire was out of control. And Johnny Harrison, a firefighter, uh, the second floor came in on him and he was killed. So there's a picture of John Harrison. Oh, here he is. The last picture of him before he, uh, he was killed and, and crushed. In Pull it the other way, Mom. Yeah. yeah, Johnny Harrison, a very, very, very nice man. And that was one of the tragedies. Lots of injuries and near deaths and many, many close calls. But uh, that's the life of a firefighter. When everybody else is running out, we have to run in. And, and uh, lots of scary moments. But as I say, more good times than bad times. I'll remember this old building. <laughs> this is my wife, Sharon. We've been married for 56 years. <laughs> Been a wonderful, wonderful 56 years. So, so Sharon, I have a question for you. Was there any time in Ron's career where you were sitting at home and worried for him? Yes, Yeah. many times. Do you have any moments that you'd like to share? I can't think of them offhand individually, can you? Well, you picked me up at the hospital a few times. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You had a few injuries on the job, right? Yes. <clears throat> Tell us a few of those. Uh, I heard torn ligaments. 
I had a ceiling come in on me uh, on Hilton Avenue. I was buried for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Managed to unbury myself. But uh, yes, there was a few times. Oh, and we had a fire in a, in a West End high rise. We had to go out, and the mother and the child were out on the balcony. And I ran out of air. It was on the sixth floor. I was Pinecrest Avenue. I ran out of air. We had a warning bell on our SCBAs when we were down to our last hundred pounds and the bell would go off and you knew enough to get out. But we couldn't because we knew the mother and the child were on the balcony. Well, going to get them, we ran out of air. And uh, as a result, I wound up in the hospital. Sharon came and got me. <laughs> <laughs> with smoke, uh, smoke accumulation, and uh, oh, there was a, a few other times, uh, but uh, unfortunately, I never really had a very serious injury. Uh, a lot of my co-workers did, but uh, thank the Lord, I got through 37 and a half years, <laughs> still in one piece. I'll be 85 in August. <laughs> so we have some questions, Ron. Um, maybe so we can have you ask the questions. Have you go in around behind? Listen carefully. They'll be in your left ear, or maybe even just beside Sharon. Okay. And uh, stand center and ask the question. Sure. You'd like, sir? Yes. Introduce yourself uh, if you'd like and uh, ask the question. Hello, my name is Miranda. It's nice to hear your stories. I was curious about how you used animals in firefighting. Mainly, I was wondering about if Dalmatians were actually ever used or if that's just a stereotype. <laughs> yes, they were. Dalmatians were in use years ago. And the main reason was to calm the horses. The Dalmatians had a calming effect on the fire ground. For some reason, I really don't know why or what calming effect that would be, but that was their main role, hmm. the Dalmatians, was to, to calm the horses. And also, there were a, a pet around the station. We never had animals in the station, uh, uh, you know, we, we never had uh, pets. I would have liked that. Who <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't? It would have been spoiled, I know that. <laughs> Thank you. So what, one big thing as well, though, is the horses. Ottawa has many, many horses up until 1929. And the last horse in the auto fire service actually ran out of the station. Many were called, called to duty and died on the way to the fire. They broke a leg, uh, they fell, they hurt themselves. And a lot of them aren't recognized as line of duty deaths, even though they were part of the Ottawa Fire Service. So one thing that uh, is very important and it's uh, dear to my heart after doing some research and a video on the horses of the Ottawa Fire Department is to ensure that they get recognized somehow. There is a memorial service every year to honor our fallen firefighters and, and legacy of courage, they call them. Any firefighter that has passed away in that present year will be met. Um, remembered at a memorial service in September and it's called uh, the Ottawa uh, Family Firefighters Community Foundation Memorial. Right, exactly. Look for the date, it's right between, beside City Hall. There's a beautiful memorial there and I think it would be a dishonor if we didn't recognize someday and put a plaque up there for the horses of the Ottawa Fire Service. <laughs> Question number two. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Claude. I've got, it's a two-part question. Okay. We hear of uh, two alarm, three alarm, four alarm fires. Could you explain the difference between those? And were you ever involved in one of the, some of the bigger ones? Oh, many, many. I know uh, uh, up to four alarms would, would, be, would, be, would, would call for assistance on the, for the fourth time at a uh, four alarm. -er. When, it, uh, when assistance is called for four different times. Like, automatically there's backup. Then if they need more backup, 
like the officer on the scene would, would, would call for assistance. That's the first alarm, second alarm, third alarm, and fourth alarm. So every time we call for a backup, it's a one level. That's home. right. That's how that. That's how that. Uh, you know, like our market fire, I think with the, I think it was actually a five alarm, for they, everybody. You know, they were begging for everybody. They even wanted the coke machine. <laughs> but anyways. They just couldn't get enough manpower for that, but uh, it eventually went out. They all eventually go out. <laughs> eventually. And then everybody has a swimming pool. That's right. <laughs> the mm -hmm. Now the second question was, was Ron ever part of some of the bigger okay. uh, fires? Perfect. Yes, we had, uh, we had many, many like that. We had, we had six houses going at, at one time in the uh, fleet and duke anybody familiar with that area fleet and duke street i believe on, 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 on Fleet it? street down in the, what we call uh, uh, the lebeton flats, flats and we had a lot of bad fires down there corner washing machine and many many multiple dwelling fires we would arrive on the scene with maybe one house going and you wind up with half a dozen going Similar to what they're experiencing in Alberta now and Quebec and Nova Scotia, it's uh, it's brutal what's going on out there now. But <laughs> let's hope they get everything under control again. So our young friend Dean here has a has a, another question there, Ron. Hi, Dean. Come on in a little closer. Yeah. So, um, what was the the big tower for? Um, the big tower was where the hose was hung after the fire. After the fire, the hose bed is emptied on the pumper truck. See all the hose in the back there? That's all gone. It has to be loaded back in, in accordion style like so. You can't load it back wet or it gets mildewed. So it had to be hung in the tower. I remember many times in this particular tower. <laughs> the hose stretching across the backyard in piles of frozen hose. It had to be thawed out, washed, washed down, and thawed out and hung. I forget how many lengths of hose could be hung in the tower, but it was, it was, it was lots of hose. We were always afraid of it coming down. <laughs> you wondered sometimes about the, the strength of of the hangers up there. But, uh, <laughs> Butch Moore yesterday, a retired firefighter, who was the last firefighter to lock the doors before it was no longer a fire department, was here yesterday, or fire station, I should say. Oh and uh, he shared a story, Ron, about how they would pull maybe four or five um, mm -hmm. lines of hose to be dry, and they yelled down, go, is that it? <laughs> and of course, no, we got three more. And what the firefighters down below would do is they would put down weighted buckets of water <laughs> oh, and pull it up. They'd pull it up, pull it up. And of course, as it got to the top, everybody get wet. <laughs> and uh, that was kind of some of the shenanigans that went on in the fire hall. But it was all part of the, the brotherhood and sisterhood that the fire service is today. And uh, some, some pranks you can get away with, some you can't. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, it's a close-knit family, is it not, Ron? It is. Uh, Even after retirement, you still meet for breakfast with some of the guys who work with the gals? We meet for breakfast once a month. And we just had a reunion dinner, annual reunion dinner. I think we had between two and three hundred there for that. And that's put on by the full-time firefighters. Yes. Not a professional firefighter association. Association. So the nice thing is there's a beautiful connection there. Oh. It's wonderful, to, you know, unfortunately, every time we go, there's people we don't see. Um, I forget how many this year that, that, that have passed away between reunion dinners, but it's like our old class of 1960. We had 33 in my class, and I think there's seven or eight left from that, from that time. <laughs> When I came on, the average life of a firefighter, I think, was in the 60s. It's improved somewhat 
with better equipment and, and, and better breathing apparatus. And uh, hopefully that will continue. So um, my wife is behind me. She goes, do I have to come up? No, you don't, because I'm going to ask Dean to ask that question. What is the question? Danielle's been, Danielle's been, Danielle's been prepped. Oh, Danielle's been prepped. OK, Danielle, <laughs> so you're going to come here, come here for a minute. It's OK. So see that second helmet on the floor? Got the visor on it. Can you bring that out and give it to Ron? You're going to ask the question. You can hold it and ask the question. Where Go is ahead, it? Danielle. Oh, she's going. So Ron, uh, Danielle, yeah, yeah. Danielle has a question for you. And uh, the, this helmet is actually my helmet that I had. Um, but it obviously isn't tin or metal. But Danielle, what's the question? Um, when you were in the fire, because the, really the helmets were metal, did they ever get hot? They got very hot in the summertime. And they were very cold in the winter time. <laughs> they're much, they're much better now, as you can see in the inside. They're li they're all lined. Oh yeah, look. They're much I'll more hold it comfortable. You feel it. Much more heavier as well. Yes, oh, that's yeah. true. Now, would those yeah. melt? That Oops. was one of the questions. Would those melt compared to obviously the tin would have melted the metal? There we go. Uh, I've seen the shape that the face shields. Do you want me to hold melt. it for you? Okay. The modern ones. Now, see the face shield on this one. Can I see that here? Thanks. I've seen these melted. Now he's going to dump the things Just drip down. You know, so that's the only part. But but the rest of the, you know, they're 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 uh, they're, they're quite safe. So did you ever have one of those types of helmet run? Uh, no, I never did. So just to your left run on the ground, there's another type of helmet. Right. It's a very. It looks like a Fisher Price helmet that kids would wear. <laughs> Do you see it there, Ron? Oh, I see, see it, yeah. The black this one here? Oh, the black one. Yeah. How about that one? Is that one similar to what you would have worn? Uh, no, uh, that, that was my, the one I have on I was the last helmet I wore. I, I never did wear one of the... Okay, so it was more like that fishbowl one there. Yes, you? right. Here's fishbowl one? Oh. Exactly, yes, yes, like that. Okay. So it actually would, would have been red, and uh, it would have been just like that, the one down below. Danielle, you're, you know, can you scoop down underneath there behind Sharon and grab that red helmet? Show it. Sharon, don't step on your microphone. That's okay. I'm going to come and help her. Step on your microphone. Yes. Did it ever burn your shoulders look like you are now? Would they ever burn your scalp? Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, fortunately, you knew enough to get out. When it was getting that hot, you were making for the door. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, that, that, that was the thing. New York firefighters still wear the old-fashioned patch coats that we wore years ago. And the reason they don't have the new bunker suits, the bunker suits let you get in too far. Before you realize that it's too far. Before you realize, but with the old-fashioned patch coat, you knew enough to get out. So a patch coat was a, a fire coat that went down to about the knees, and then of course the boots would come up to your your hips. And uh, two o'clock in the morning, when the tones went off, and you're doing great holding that, thank you. Two o'clock in the morning, when the tones come off, and you forget to put your pants on, and you go down that hole in your underwear, <laughs> and you forget to put your pants on, and you pull up those boots, and you put that coat. And it's minus 20 in the back, and minus 20 outside. Things get flapping in the wind, it gets really cold. Eh? It, it's happened. It's happened. It's happened. It's happened? It's happened. <laughs> so this is a helmet that Daniela is going to show you. Is that similar to what you had when you retired? Yes. So go ahead and just That's let a it nice hold one. there. You did a great job. Thank you very yeah, much. Very much so. <laughs> Yeah, and that fit, that fit. And, uh, so that's similar to the helmet that... Uh, that face shield was very, very handy. A flashover is something that occurs often when firefighting. And that face shield protected your, your face from a flashover. And a flashover, a ba or backdraft, is often called. I don't know whether any of you have ever experienced a wood stove. And when you open the draft on a wood stove, woof! you'll feel the fire explode. Well, the same thing happens in a house. 
if you're in there fighting the fire and somebody opens the door or the, the aerial crew ventilates, they have to ventilate at the fire. It's very hot inside. So they ventilate. Now they ventilate through the roof, that's called vertical ventilation, or they cross ventilate, that's by opening windows. That allows the firefighter into the fire where it would normally be attainable. Well, I want to thank Ron and Sharon for sharing stories and for your <laughs> questions. Please give them a hand. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, Ron. Okay. The bench used to sit right here. Right here. And we got in trouble one day. A cop went by in a cruiser and he yelled, pretty soft, eh? And one of the guys said, yeah, just like your head. Well, he came in and he said, who said that? And everybody pointed at each other. <laughs> yeah. He used to take a pail of water and go to that window with a pail of water and dump it, lean out and dump it on the guys on the bench, hey? Every once in a while they get caught. <laughs> And of course, you used to hang out and have great chats out here, smoke breaks, the whole bit, right? Oh, yeah. Well, Jack O'Neill was sitting on the bench here one day smoking a big cigar. And the citizen came by and got a picture of it. That was the end of it. We weren't allowed to sit out anymore. So what did you do with the benches then? Around the back. Oh, okay. So there was always a, a way of uh, changing things up a little bit? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Didn't go over very well with the chief. <laughs> Right at the bottom of the stairs there, Kevin, was a little tiny bathroom. It wasn't a sink, just a toilet. It was a landing. Yeah, that was a landing there. And it was at the same level as the landing. And, and of course the washroom was right here. That's where all the calls came in. And I hear a voice behind me. Who do we have here? Who do we have? Who are you? Kevin Kevin you were in the Ottawa Fire Service at one time? Yeah, I, I, I did uh, some time, quite a bit of time with them. But, but it used to be the, 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 the district chief, because the, the Western District ran out of here. Yeah. And the watch desk was pretty close to here, I guess, yeah, right but it was there. wide open. And so, every time he started the car, you got a, 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 load, a load of exhaust. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and the guy on watch would be in charge of the doors, and so he would suffer the consequences. But the, the guy down here had it rough in that sense, and uh, the same thing coming back. You'd hear it beep beep, open the door, let him in, car come in, it's winter time, it'd be cool off pretty quick, and then, the, and then if the rigs were out, They'd be so cold, and when they come back in, it would lower the temperature again for the guy on watch. It oh, was, yeah. Uh, it was a unique station in that way. I oh, guess. it sure yeah. was. It was fun. Yeah. This is where the lieutenant and the captain, their office, and the desk was right behind you, a big desk there. And uh, they had their lockers in here, too. But this was their room. The district chief was on the other side of the dorm over there on the northern part of the, 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 the room. And the, and the other thing too, it was the, the station, the, there was a real shortage of lockers, so you had to share lockers. Because there, there was some lockers big, in the kitchen and, and then in that little notch over on the other right side. Off the big door, man. Yeah. At the lockers, you could, you could sleep in there. <laughs> but, but, but that was one of the, uh, you know, when you came in as a, as a rookie, you had to uh, uh, hope that you know somebody would take pity on you and share their locker with you, yeah. or, or, or or something, you know. And uh, it was uh, the floors noisy, the uh, the old uh, heating system and uh, <laughs> and everything. And the district chief had a dorm on the far corner and on the northeast yeah. corner of, of the building. That was his, that was a district chief's, yeah. That's an interesting room now, so we will take a walk over there. And I just wanted to just um, 
for our viewing audience. I just want to introduce again uh, Kevin. Crook, last name Crook, is Crook, Crookshank. 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 And you're retired from the Ottawa Fire Service after how many years? 31 and a half. 31. When were you hired? Uh, on March 6, 1978. And retired? October of 2009. To October 2009. Or August, I guess, maybe. What, too. what was your rank? Captain. Captain. And of course, Ron, hired 1960. January the 4th, 1960, retired 97 May. Yeah. 97. And retired in as uh, which uh, capacity you were? Uh, I was a captain, acting district chief. Acting district chief. And here we are, old station 11 at 424 Parkdale, now the Better Business Bureau. And uh, so sharing about this uh, this room here, um, so there would have been a captain that would have slept in this room. And a lieutenant. And a lieutenant. And uh, there's a big map behind you. Is that uh, kind of like your GPS back then? Uh, that, was, <laughs> that was downstairs. Yes. Yeah, that uh, was downstairs. yeah it was. Yeah, I, I would say uh, for, for, for the new guys, but, but, but so many of the... Uh, so, so many of the officers um, uh, knew this area really, really well. Yeah. You know, they 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 would they would they would, they would help out uh, the young guy if he was driving or something like that. Uh, they were pretty good that way. We had street drill all the time because yeah. it was important. Uh, knowing the district was a, as important as anything uh, uh, in firefighting because you could be the best firefighter in the world. And if you didn't know where you were going, you weren't very good. <laughs> and so the street drill took place uh, at, least, at least once a month. Oh, yeah. Or, 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 uh, the captain would draw in all the streets with no names on them, and, you had, and they had to go in and fill in the names, eh? Hey? <laughs> then you went out on familiarization tours, too, with the apparatus, pre-planning different places, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, and this area, too, I mean, uh, d- depending where you go, uh, some of the street signs are hard to see. Mm-hmm. They weren't. Uh, they were white with black letters. They were yeah. didn't lend themselves to great. But we also did the block inspecting. Yes. Regular, and uh, you know, knocking on doors. Yeah, yes. per, per, just just a inspection assistance, I'd call it. But yeah, um, but that helped you too. Do you remember your first sta- station, Kevin? I was. Uh, my first station was Churchill Avenue, number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then I went to the number two down Bay and Lisger in my rotation. Yeah. Then I went to f- five and Celeron Clark. Then I went ended up at uh, Lincoln Fields and Tavistock for uh, that was sort of my final station. Old twelve. Yeah, and then I I came here with a, a group of reprobates. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you remember uh, your first truck that you uh, ended up driving? What was it? Do you remember? Driving? Uh, like for, 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 for on response, uh, it would have been uh, probably at, at number 12. Start with the, they had a, uh, an aerial truck with a kind of electric shift. It was kind of a unique yes. shift system on it. And uh, the pump was a uh, an international with the old 850, eh? Yeah, and, and you rode on the on the tailgate. You rode on the tailgate. Yeah. A little dangerous. Uh, well, no, you know, it, yeah, but I, I don't think of the danger. I just think I remember how you know you in the winter you put the tarp over the top of the guys like the the, the hose bed cover to, to 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 stay warm a bit. Pretty cold job. Yeah. But in order to catch the hydrant, it was very handy. It was standing on the back. Because when you were straight laying into the fire, you know, the, the, you could pull the cutoffs and the hose off the back to catch the hydrant. So it was a very convenient place. Now they have to go from the cab, run back, eh? Yeah, and it's high now, too. Yeah. So they, the, 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 the rigs are, are big. And of course, they didn't have hydrant keys attached to their belts. They have to take it out of a, a bag now. Yeah, the yeah. large hydrant key was stuck in the hose bed, eh? The, and, and the hydrants, but but you know I think uh, in the winter the, the 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 city hired a lot of people to check hydrants. Yes. More more, more, more so than now. More so, they just don't yeah, shove, I, they don't yeah. shovel them out now. We used to have to go out and shovel the hydrants. Yeah. yeah. They didn't let one man out of the station to shovel the hydrants in the district. What a job that was! Yeah. Now they don't do them at all. No, they're uh, maybe once a. 
a month. Maybe I see the guy, there's a hydrant very near to me and I see when he comes around, you know. But so, so we're actually in the uh, south uh, east corner of the old Station 11. We're going to take a trip down memory lane and head to some of the other areas. Maybe where the uh, beds were, where the district chief has had his quarters. Yeah. We're going to look at the host tower, where the infamous pool table was that every station had. So we're going to continue our tour with uh, Ron Cutbill and Kevin Crookshank. We're going to head out and go to the other part of the building. All right, well, here I am with Ron and, and Kevin again. And, and to my left behind the, uh, the, the uh, screen here, behind the camera, is Erin Lytle and her father was on the job, Lauren Lytle, for many, many years. And of course, we're going to share stories about Lauren and, and the connection that you had with Ron, uh, with Lauren on the job. So tell us a little bit about the dormitories. How? How what? The dormitories, or where you slept. What was it okay. like? This was part of the huge room. It was yeah. all dorm, all where the men slept, eh? The officers slept, of course, in their... just off the, off the main dorm here. And, and the, uh, the district was in the other corner. Yeah, and the district was over in this corner. It can get pretty noisy at night with the snoring. <laughs> and, 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 and uh, you know, a lot of times the windows were open and street noise, but oh, you, you got used to it. You got used to it. The, the, the details used to have issues with it when they'd come in at night sometimes, at the buses and... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, what time was bedtime? Were the lights out at a certain time? No. You were allowed to turn in at 10. Yeah. But you had to be on the apparatus floor at 7 a.m. So you could not come up the stairs until 10 o'clock or oh, no, no, rooms no, no. back there that you can... Uh, yeah. Oh, you could come upstairs, but you weren't allowed to uh, have a nap, have a nap yeah. until 10. Because okay. the, the drills and everything would, would be set up for in there because there was room to accommodate the men. I so, think it was better. So I mean, we kind of got the windows behind, but behind there would have been where the kitchen was, the uh, main... The billiard, uh, the billiard room. Yeah, the billiard room, where you guys would uh, connect with uh, instructions. Yeah. Big table to eat at. Yeah, and the, there was a TV in there. Uh, remember with the, the old uh, cable connected remotes there with the... Yes. Uh, yeah. Usually the they, uh, remotes had a short lifespan. It seemed like. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the lectures were held downstairs mainly in, around yeah. the washroom. Eh? Mm -hmm. they, uh, they put extra chairs up there at night for a, for a lecture or, or whatever was going on. And now, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about these two helmets here. And they certainly are a very big part of the young lady's life who is uh, behind me here because it belonged to her father. But a very good friend of yours, Lauren Lytle. Yes, very good and, friend. And um, maybe you can just share a little bit about your connection with Lauren, and uh, you know some of the, the good times that you had with him. Lordy, Lordy and I were very good friends on and off the job as well. You know, I remember being over. <laughs> funny story. I remember being over to see Lordy, and Erin and her sister would be there, and one day. I taught, told them that I had a hole in my thumb. And I had a hole in my thumb here. And if I blew on my thumb, I could blow up my muscle. Well, Lorne said, you really had me in a fix. He said, all day long, they were blowing on that thumb, trying to blow up their muscles. He said, <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> Well, Lord and I had uh, lots of fun, yeah. for sure. And uh, there's his two helmets. He was number 46. Number 46. Yeah. And uh, he died at 46. And he passed away at the age of 46. And uh, yes, that's right. Uh, yeah. Can I flip the camera around? This is this is uh, th this is Aaron, who I've chatted a lot with because of organizing a connection with you and her uncle Dave Smith and a bunch of other firefighters to come over here and, and share 
about the time with Lauren Lytle. So we still have to plan that. We still have to plan that. But today is all about the tour, and, and of course, uh, the reunion is wonderful today, Aaron. Thank you so much for uh, bringing in your dad's helmets, and uh, both, you know, what an honor to be sitting here with them, because uh, that helmet that was put on your dad's head went to a lot of calls. Do you remember any calls, Ron, that you went with Lauren that uh, was memorable? Oh, many calls. Lorne was a... A firefighter's firefighter. He was an excellent firefighter. So much so that we used to worry about him sometimes. And I remember at the uh, lumber yard on Bayview Road, we lost him in the basement. Did he ever tell you about that? And anyway, <laughs> we were outside looking for him and he was still inside and he was banging on a basement window. And he got twisted around in the basement. Oh, it was, a, it was another close call, but Lorne was an excellent firefighter. He got hurt a few times too, didn't he? He sure did. Yeah. Yeah, he broke his... I remember at the uh, the hotel on Armstrong. What was that? Sterling? What was the name of that hotel? The Sterling? The Sterling. Lorne broke his ankle. He fell down the stairs with Ronnie Charlebaugh. Ronnie broke something too that day. The guy died that set the fire there. Wow. He went in with gasoline and poured it all around. When he threw the match, he went up with he went up with the hotel. Terrible! My so, goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, oh, lots of fires with Lorne. But lots of great times with the family too. Oh, what a great connection! I'll say. And, and that's what's really important with the firefighting family is exactly. the, the fact that they, you, you folks have stuck so close together. I want to thank you for taking the time. We're going to head into the hose tower now. Okay. <laughs> and we're going to check out that hose tower. We're going to have Aaron come with us. It's pretty tight quarters. It's hot in there, but we'll. Uh, I've got a few minutes left with this battery, so let's use it up. And what I don't, I will use my phone. So, so here we are in Host Tower 11 with Ron and Kevin and Aaron Lytle stuck right in between two tall gentlemen, okay? <laughs> and uh, Kevin, you never etched your name into the bricks of Host Tower 11, have you? No. So you are going to do that right now. Well, I just sort of stuck it right there. Okay, so is it there? Well, kind of, sure. Kind yeah. of? Good enough for posterity. Where is it? Right here. There we go. Awesome. Awesome. So there's Kevin's name. Yep. And you are going to honor your father. I would like Ron to do it. Please. You got you. Okay. okay. I, I'm going to just move out of the way yeah. right here. It's a very spot. tight spot. Watch your own. Yeah. Oh, very, very tight spot. <laughs> Scratching Lauren Lytle's name. How's that? <laughs> So let's put his years of service. Let's put his years of service. Number 46. Pension oh. shit's going on now. <laughs> there we go. Let's put his years of service. Oh, yeah. So when did, when did he start? He came on in the um, in 60s. He was in our class. Okay. Um, and we January 4th, 1960 to. December 18, 1986. So 1960, just put 60 to 86. 60 slash 86. Awesome. And this host tower, we've talked about earlier, so we won't spend much time in here, but uh, it, uh, you spent a lot of time Climbing up that ladder, didn't you, Ron? You're not kidding. All the way up. Many, many times. Yeah. 
So I want to thank you, Ron, for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. And Kevin, thank you so much you're for spending welcome. time here as well. Mm -hmm. I'll let you guys uh, mingle a little bit more and uh, we'll sign off. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs>